Martin Scorsese, one of cinema's all-time greatest directors, who is also an open fan of horror movies. He cited the likes of The Innocents, The Haunting and Hereditary amongst those that have wowed him, yet one movie which Scorsese continuously addresses as one of his all-time favourites is Peeping Tom. But despite inspiring one filmmaker, why did it destroy the career of another? I'm going to analyse the deeply disturbing concept of the film while also addressing its cultural impact off the back of its controversy. Let's get into it. The horrifying grip of 1960s Peeping Tom comes down to its uncomfortable concept. It doesn't rely on ghosts or monsters to create its terror. It utilises something far more plausible. Mark Lewis is a very talented cameraman. He does a variety of jobs, including working for a film studio and taking some sultry snapshots to be sold at the local newsagents. He dreams of becoming a director and is clearly passionate about making films, spending a large portion of his time in his studio developing pictures and watching over his work. What's the horror twist then? Mark also happens to be psychologically scarred from his childhood and is fascinated by fear, so he stalks and murders women, filming their reactions in order to create his magnum opus, a documentary on fear. That's what Peeping Tom boils down to, a man, a camera and murder, with innocent people being snuffed out because of an artistic license to kill. Why this film was perceived as such a shocker back in 1960 was definitely influenced by its use of point of view. Though there are older examples of horror films showing the killer's perspective, and it would go on to be a common element of the slasher genre, Peeping Tom's use of POV cleverly comes through Mark's camera lens. The audience becomes the killer through film itself as Mark lurks around, hunting his prey, aiming to get them in the right position to strike to incite the best reaction possible for his documentary. His methods of killing include using a sharpened tripod leg to stab his victims, as they stare into a distorting mirror, witnessing their own twisted expression as they are killed. The image of the distortion is genuinely creepy, but it's the implied conceptual horror of Mark's activities which bring about the nightmare fuel to me here. It's not a bloody or graphic film, and it's not particularly a scary film necessarily, yet in principle, at its core, it's the thought of Mark's activities and the reasons behind them which get under my skin. And what makes it even more unsettling is how Mark comes across as a person played solidly by Karl-Heinz Böhm, he's generally quite pleasant and even to an extent shy, especially around women. He's unassuming, so knowing that deep down he's got this terrible alter ego living within him, it makes Mark a frightening character. It's that Norman Bates effect where he seems really lovely on the surface, so at first glance you'd never know the evil which lies beneath. And interestingly, both Psycho and Peeping Tom were released in the same year. Yet when Mark isn't in social situations where he comes across as awkward, when he's in his natural habitat of plotting his kills, he switches into a different beast altogether. He adapts into work mode, where he's hyper-focused just trying to find the shot he desires. Take the example of where he kills Viv. They go to the film studio after hours on the promise Mark and Viv are going to make a film together. What Viv doesn't know is it'll be her final one. Mark's body language here is chilling. Viv prances around the place like a wannabe starlet while Mark shuns her off, just wanting to set up the environment to be exactly how he wants it, calculating every tiny detail while Viv is none the wiser. At the point where Mark readies himself to approach for the kill, Viv moves out of that perfect position he's found, and Mark becomes visibly annoyed. He's about to murder an innocent woman and she doesn't have a clue, yet the fact that altering her stance irritates Mark says everything about him. He doesn't care about Viv, she's not a person, she's a prop for his documentary and nothing more. That is a deeply concerning contemplation. 
where the value of human life is purely aesthetic. However, the more we learn about Mark, the more you grow to understand his actions. They're not justifiable by any means, but when you learn about Mark's upbringing, the nightmare fuel redirects to his childhood. Mark was raised by a father who was himself a filmmaker, yet his films make you realise why Mark grows up to be the way he is. Mark's father was fascinated by fear and its relation to the human nervous system. He wanted to study fear documenting it, much like Mark does in his adulthood. But where does Mark get his inspiration to carry on that case study? He was his father's case study. Mark's father literally used his own son as an experiment to establish his career as a reputable psychologist. He took his child and provoked fear in him using a plethora of stimuli, including putting a lizard on his bed. He even filmed Mark's reaction to seeing his mother on her deathbed. It's sickening how he was willing to put his son in psychologically scarring situations purely for his own gain. Mark is, in effect, a victim of torture, so it's no wonder why he grew up not only having a personal affiliation with fear, but to be a mentally damaged human being. Mark's disturbance running through his childhood and his adulthood gives him the ability to reflect on himself. He understands his actions. Even though we see Mark with two different personas, Owners, depending on the scenario he finds himself in, it doesn't feel like a split personality. Mark is fully aware of what he does and why he does it, not only performing the kills with an end goal in mind, but frequently watching those kills back again and again. These aren't isolated moments of madness. These are his own case studies, and his cognizance is expressed through how he speaks with his neighbour Helen, who becomes somewhat of an affectionate interest for Mark. One evening, Helen points Mark's camera at herself, to which, without haste, he pushes it away, stating that anything he photographs, he loses. Mark implies here that he only uses his camera for his criminal purposes, acknowledging it as though he has a clear awareness of that. Then later, when Helen sees one of Mark's kill films, he tells her to go into the shadows of the studio so he can't see her face. He says that she'll be safe so long as he can't see see her frightened. Effectively, even though Mark cares about Helen and doesn't want to harm her, the very sight of fear on her face could spring him into action and make him want to film her, therefore meaning he'd wind up losing her too. Mark was a child who was broken by a corrupt father, and it altered his perception of the world for life. He understands within himself that he has no choice but to carry on his father's work, as though it's an inescapable fate. A fascinating concept, yet this plot element is where one of Peeping Tom's major pieces of backlash is established. In the film, the father and the young Mark were played by the film's director, Michael Powell, and his own son. When this knowledge got out into the world, critics slammed this creative decision. They believed that Powell was too attached to the themes of the film. That personal attachment between director and film can be further identified by Powell's first film camera being amongst Mark's collection of cameras. Yet critics took Powell's own appearance in the film as a means to presume that he himself was psychologically disturbed, and that taking advantage of his own son was abusive, making him no worse than Mark's father. However, when he was an adult, Powell's son laughed off these accusations, though at the time it was enough to garner nuclear heat towards Peeping Tom. By being torn apart by critics, causing a widespread negative public reaction, and by having the concept of child abuse injected into it, Peeping Tom was pulled from cinemas in Britain after only five days. Michael Powell never recovered from this. Though he did continue to work as a director, his reputation was destroyed and he was unable to recover. Yes, his legacy has been an influence on other directors, not just the aforementioned Scorsese, but also Francis Ford Coppola and Giorgio Romero, to name but few. Yet, it's Peeping Tom itself which now possesses quite the reputation within the horror film industry. Premiere listed it as one of their 25 most dangerous films. It found itself on Steven Schneider's 1001 Movies You Must See Before You Die,
Eye, while world-famous film critic Roger Ebert also had it down as one of his great movies. I think that Peeping Tom is a film of technical brilliance with gorgeous giallo-esque lighting and a creative use of camera angles, plus a very haunting concept at its centrepiece. The Nightmare Fuel Hall of Fame is one that expands across time, and I think that contextually, Peeping Tom deserves to be on this list purely from its reputational standpoint, and by leaving a lingering impression all these years later. Plus, my personal favourite horror movie quote of all time is in it, which I'm going to play in just a moment. But that's my Nightmare Fuel analysis of 1960s Peeping Tom. If you appreciated this video and would like to share what you thought of the film, comment down below, and also a subscribe to the channel would be much appreciated to help us out with our analytics and put us in front of new people. That'd be a big help and I thank you very much in advance. I've been Connor from Unleash the Ghouls and, as promised, roll the clip. Do you know what the most frightening thing in the world is? It's fear. <laughs>